Welcome to the place where we learn about and learn from the leaders in our field who are powering human creativity. I am Aaron Dworkin, and this is Arts Engines. <laughs> Thanks again for joining me here on Arts Engines. Today's guest is Aaron Flagg, my namesake, who serves as chair and associate director of Juilliard Jazz. Aaron, welcome to the show. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. So, and I would be, of course, remiss for our audience if I did not share that I have not only had the opportunity to know and see all of Aaron's work in the professional world up front for so many years, but we actually spent time at the University of Michigan working on our degrees together. So it is truly an honor, and I'm very excited to be able to have you on the show. Same here. Go Blue. I knew Aaron Dworkin win. <laughs> <laughs> I knew Aaron Flagg went, so that's it. Uh, so this is, it's so great. And, you know, you've had, you know, this opportunity, not only, you know, now in terms of your leadership role at, at Juilliard, uh, you served as, as dean and were a professor of music at the Hart School, um, but and you've also had all of these board roles. And so I wanted to kind of delve into this issue surrounding DE&I, right? So it is, um, you know, this past year, I think it's been talked about more in our field than ever before. Uh, even though back at Michigan over 20 years ago, you were leading our efforts of the Black student uh, group at the school uh, and our organization that we had. Um, and so I'm curious, how do you view this past year? Do you think there's been a sea change? Do you think change is really coming as it relates to de &I? Kind of curious your overarching view, and then we can get into some more details. Yeah, no, I appreciate that question. It is, um, well, clearly there's much more focus, much more, many more conversations, much more broader interest in the topic of equity and inclusion in uh, not just orchestras, but in classical music and in music in general, uh, than uh, you and I have seen in, in, in 20 years or so, uh, thanks to your founding work with Sphinx and so many others, it has laid out a map for people to follow. So um, I'm excited by what's happening around the world. The orchestras I'm, and organizations I'm consulting with uh, in, in Europe and other places are really feeling the, the glow from America. There's a lot of awakening, a lot of conversations, and obviously uh, for some many unfortunate reasons, obviously George Floyd, the various protests, uh, Michael Brown, all of these things, and not only the, the killing of black men and women, but also the infiltration of this social horror into the average day-to-day -day lives of Americans. I'm remembering Michael Brown's passing and in Ferguson and how during a St. Louis Symphony concert, there were protesters who, uh, you know, made their voices known during a concert and, and created some dialogue between the audience and themselves about what are you going to do? What's your response to what's happening in the world? And I think it's fair, uh, although we're not post-racial, despite what everyone thought about President Obama's tenure and what it would bring, I think it, and obviously most recently President Trump's administration really has a uh, set a situation where people cannot hide from these conversations and where people of color, women, the, the relatively marginalized historically, how are feeling much more emboldened to speak up and say, hey, we need to talk about this. Let's have this conversation. And I think, thank goodness, there are really wonderful people in positions of power in our field who are, have become ready to listen and ready to engage. And so I am incredibly excited about this period for our field. Awesome, awesome. So to kind of delve down, and I, I'll get to kind of higher ed academ uh, uh, academia in just a second, but to start with orchestras. Um, you know, we've got a lot of our audience who are leadership or working at orchestras, et cetera, and, um, and just, um, and a lot of them are, I think, you know, can be looking at these issues sometimes going, okay, we, we understand we need to make change. We understand we are not representative but not really sure either what to do or if we have to choose one of several things to do, which is going to have the biggest impact. From your perspective and where you sit, and especially with your role uh, at the board at the League of, on the board of the League of American Orchestras, 
what would you say would be the top one or two things if, if all of those orchestras are you know watching right now and listening what would you say if you were going to do one thing in the next year or two or two things it would be these two things that you should focus on well, I'm going to say something that's probably uh, unusual, is that what I think all members of these orchestras, board members, staff member, musicians should actually do is actually learn the history of our industry. And if you actually uh, learn the history of the industry, how did this industry form? Where do did, where did orchestras come from? Why, why did they form? And to learn that they were, they were formed as private clubs first musician clubs, just musician collectives, and then into membership clubs. Just right there, understanding that foundation, let alone the over 70 years of segregated unions in America from 1901 to 1974 approximately, really will uh, hopefully have people wake up to, gee, uh, there are some systemic issues in this field that I didn't cause, but as I participate in this field, I need to understand the history. So one is understanding history, which I also add includes multiracial orchestras in the end of the 18th century and into the 19th century, which we don't know anything about. Our history seems to start with 1842 in the New York Philharmonic. Lovely right. it is, there were many multiracial, multi-gender orchestras throughout this country that actually should be the founding of our American orchestra industry that would actually help open us up. So one is history, and even the history of your orchestra in certain times. How did it respond to the civil rights movement? What was his reaction if it existed back in uh, during the Plessy versus uh, Ferguson trial with the Supreme Court? How, what, what was the impact of these social movements on my field? How did my field respond? So I think one is history. And the second thing I think, think uh, orchestras should do and individuals should do is look into these holy grail tropes. Uh, excellence is contrary to diversity, or uh, we are entirely a meritocracy. All the music that we program is great masterpieces. Well, as a musician, that's a lie. We all know that um, orchestras every year are programming sometimes mediocre pieces by white composers. Just that, just saying that out loud, it feels like heresy. But as musicians, we know that to be true. And in terms of meritocracy on the stage, every musician that I know, although I want them to have health care and food on the table and security like every American and, and happy in what they do in their work, to actually say we the best musicians at the best time and the best, well, that's not true. If we had an army of uh, Michigan, Curtis, Eastman, Juilliard graduates uh, audition for every seat every year, there would be a lot of change that would take place. Uh, much like the NFL draft that just happened. You know, Aaron Rodgers, Jimmy Garoppolo, they have to watch their back. We don't have that situation in orchestras. And if we did, I think the trope of meritocracy would be questioned. And that's not to say people don't deserve a job or they, they weren't great when they won their job. But if you use this trope as a way to keep people out, then I think we should go all the way. So history and re-examining our tropes. Wow. So I think it's so informative. And, and also that I think people shouldn't just kind of sometimes they feel like they almost have a cavalier at, oh, well, of course, this is bad. Let's do something. Let's have a concert. Let's have an initiative. And I just love the, the depth and the, the seriousness, basically, which is what I hear that you're saying orchestras should take. And, and that yeah, I loved your comment about individuals, right? Because all institutions are comprised of individuals. It's the individuals that make a difference. Um, and so I just, I love both of those points. Um, so to, to kind of flip a little bit uh, over to higher education. So you've had, you know, this vantage point across both areas. And so now in your role at Juilliard, I'm curious, do you see similar things in the academic world or do you see any different challenges as it relates to incorporating and actually bringing about real change and impact in the DEI space? No, great question. And if I may, I'll expand a bit uh, to not just higher ed, but I was executive director of a community music school for many years, worked in, uh, in art, teaching artist processes with K through 12 public education. And so then having the pleasure of, of working in higher education, uh, seeing the whole spectrum, there's a similar, similar challenge, which is this as assumptions, the assumed holy grails, uh, the great masterworks, um, and, and this idea of saying, 
uh, in higher ed at the conservatory level and school of music level, there is this uh, blaming of the profession, which I find fascinating. Well, we can only do Beethoven and uh, Scriabin and Shostakovich because that's what the orchestras are asking in their auditions. It's not our fault that we're miseducating or undereducating our students about music. It's because of the profession. So one, that's one problematic excuse. But I think that's starting to change here at Juilliard under the lead, led by our just recent provost, Aria, Aria Guzalimian, um, was a desire to ask all of the faculty to think to spend last summer uh, researching five pieces by black composers and women of color, so the BIPOC composers and women of color, that they would enthusiastically want to recommend to their students. And it was like we were all in and people were in middle school discovering pieces and like, oh my goodness, I've never heard this oboe concerto. And the school has placed that information on its website with links, with uh, library resources. So it's in the library. We've changed our audition repertoire to be much more inclusive of BIPOC and women composers. So I think there is, uh, with good leaders, there is the possibility for conversations that get people to look outside their assumed repertoire. Um, and as you know, in, in K through 12, uh, some of the nursery rhymes and music used to introduce students, people have found out are racist and come from minstrelsy. And oh my goodness, aren't there other ways to teach tertiary harmony like barbershop quartets or Sousa marches or you know, what have you. So I think uh, musicians, educators are beginning to, to realize that the goals we want to teach in music can be taught just as well with a more expanded canon, um, which will not only, uh, it has nothing to do with checking a box. It, it has to do with living out our express goal of loving great music. And great music, I believe, is everywhere, not just in one group of people, male and white that there's great music there, but there's also great music of female and Asian. Let's try to find all of it. If we truly say that we love music. Yeah, uh, these are just such extraordinary points. And, um, and as we look forward, given this kind of sense of, of change, right? More so certainly than the past couple of decades, where do you see things in five years or so? Do you think things will be demonstrably different? Are you optimistic? Oh, I'm very optimistic. And I think a way I look at it is I work with the Juilliard students here in all the divisions and get to see where they're at different than when I was a Juilliard student last century, I like to tell them, um, is that they have believed what American society has told them with the annual Martin Luther King holiday. They believe, they took at face value that people will be judged by the content of their character, not the color of their skin. They took that in wholeheartedly as children. And so now as they come to college, they're surprised, they're aghast. Why isn't it that way? Fix it. So I think that sense of empowerment, that sense, that birthright of yes, things should be equal um, is empowering them to speak up in ways that are leading or many of these institutions to make change. And so I think this change, which is happening uh, slowly, but is on programs at, at orchestras uh, and who they're hiring, be it uh, senior level leadership in inclusion work, uh, consultants that they're meeting with for various training opportunities, the great work of, of the Sphinx organization to hold people accountable with data and the conference. I think all of these are part of the infrastructure that will keep us from receding backwards. That, but also will require all of us to refine our thinking so that we, none of us are just mouthing tropes that we, like my father said to me once when I was a kid, and he said, well, children should be seen and not heard. And when he said that, I could tell that he was just parroting what his parents had told him. And of course, I, being more emboldened than he, said, why is that true? <laughs> I hear you. Awesome. Awesome. So unfortunately, we are just about out of time. But you yourself, right, separate from all of these issues, you are just an extraordinary leader and have been, whether orchestral world, education, higher education, et cetera. So I'm curious, and for all of those administrators who watch the show, when you're faced with challenges, tough days, things that you feel like, oh my gosh, this problem is almost insurmountable, 
what do you what do you do as an administrative leader? Um, what do you call upon for energy, for strength, for courage to get you past those tough days? That's a great question, and I'll give three answers. First of all, I have a personal board of directors that I created about 15, 20 years ago, uh, people who could help me with specific administrative challenges. How do I address this? Where do I go to get information on this? I'm stuck in a, what are most of the time people problems, a personal conflict. How do I resolve it respectfully? So having elders to refer to is great. I think another thing is history and realizing that, you know, having read uh, Frederick Douglass's autobiography, I ain't got a day nowhere near as bad as his best day. <laughs> so he, he, when you read about the history of what great leaders of any color, any country have been through, that encourages me to see that we can make it through. And last but not least is the power of the art itself. We get to interact, I do, with great, incredibly gifted young people um, whose promise and ability is so inspiring in and of itself. And to be a part of, of hearing them play, watching them work, seeing them grow, uh, really inspires me not to give up at all. Wow. Well, Aaron Flagg, you truly are one of the arts engines who is powering human creativity in our world. Thank you so much for your leadership and thank you for joining us on the show. Pleasure to be here. Thank you, Aaron, for making this possible. Thank you.